Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Kyle Bass, founder and principal of Heyman Capital Management, and John McGlynn, journalist and researcher. They touch on President Biden and Xi Jinping's summit, the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, and what it means going forward. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Great to be here. So to begin with, recently in the headlines a lot is the U.S.-China Commission on Security and Economic Review. And so they're calling to restrict investing in China. So beyond that, what are some actionable steps you think we could kind of take in really stemming that threat? I mean, if we could, if we actually did one thing as a government, um, my preference would be to start harmonizing the lists between the Commerce Department's uh, Bureau of Industry Security, um, the the Treasury Department's um, uh, OFAC list, and the Pentagon's DOD uh, procurement list. These analysts, hey, here's a great example. Today, there are 257 companies on the BIS entity list at Commerce. There are only seven entities on Treasury's list that over, overlap. So there are 250 entities that are still, quote, investable by U.S. individuals and institutions that the Commerce Department has flagged as a risk to U.S. national security. That makes no sense. And so if we start harmonizing the work that we've done in the various uh, uh, presidential cabinet uh, departments, um, I think we could go a long way to at least, if we don't ban all investment in China, uh, but we ban the companies that are state-owned and, and military-run or risks to U.S. national security, that would be a quantum leap from where we are today. And so now there are also reports saying that Wall Street has waken up to the reality of China. So first, do you think that's true? And if so, how would that affect Americans? They all understand uh, that China is the enemy. They all understand um, the subversive things that that government does. Uh, around the world to, to all the world's governments. Um, they understand that China's the risk to the rule of law and the rules-based West and all of these things that finally um, governments around the world are understanding. Um, but Wall Street gets 12% of their revenue from China, doing Chinese deals. And these guys on Wall Street like big fat paychecks every year. And so until there's leadership uh, at the presidential level and at the congressional level that, that starts to restrict this kind of investment and underwriting, um, Wall Street's just going to keep moving forward. I, I, I always joke and say, if U.S. national security was left up to Wall Street, we'd all be speaking Chinese tomorrow. So aside from, say, actionable steps from the presidential level, is there anything else that would maybe move Wall Street in that direction? Sure. I mean, uh, if a group of legislators got together and said that, you know, investing our pensioners' money, investing U.S. assets, whether it's institutional or individual assets, into a regime that's actively perpetrating crimes against humanity and, and, and an ethnic and cultural genocide, not only with the Uyghurs, but with the Tibetans and the Mongolians and basically anyone that's not Han Chinese, as you know, is in real trouble. Um, why we keep funding that is beyond me. And once that schism is finally broken, then there, there is a good reason to say we should completely decouple from China. It makes complete sense to me that we should be decoupling. It's just hard to do when the incentives of all the players are to keep us going because they're earning, uh, they're earning some blood money from China. And so also recently, China started a new stock exchange in the northern part of the city. So how significant do you think this is? Well, China essentially gutted Hong Kong. Hong Kong used to be the financial center of the world in Asia. China would much rather see that uh, move inside and be in Shanghai or the new Beijing Stock Exchange. They're, they're preparing for a world where it's a it's a basically a bipolar world. It's a world of the rules-based order in the West, and then the bad guys. And the bad guys is you know China, Russia, Iran, uh, Venezuela, everyone that is uh, called autocratic totalitarian governments. Um, and I think today China has such a uh, dependency on the U.S. dollar and the SWIFT system. And and as they think about 
next year and the years to come. They're rolling out their central bank digital currency. They're trying to lessen their dependence on dollars. If their dollar capacity was removed from them overnight, if we took them off the SWIFT system, their entire economy would collapse literally overnight. Um, so we have that economic nuclear button here, and we will use it if they move on Taiwan today. But if they're successful in moving exchanges into China, moving their dollar dependency, uh, moving away from dollar dependency, which is what they're moving to their CBDC is, um, their militaristic belligerence uh, can then uh, advance unabated around the world. And, and it's something the West better pay a lot of attention to. And we need to, I believe we need to outlaw their new central bank digital currency in the West. And so speaking of China's ambitions in the, say, digital sector, what would be some steps in stemming this before it, say, overtakes the world? I believe that the adoption of their central bank digital currency is cancerous to the West. It's the adoption of the Chinese tech stack. It is. It has a mind of its own. Their human data project is will interface with their rollout of the CBDC, and they'll be able to effectuate bribes to individuals outside of the purview of banking regulators or sovereign regulatory oversight. And so uh, it'll be a brave new world for a Chinese Communist Party who's known uh, to bribe, steal, coerce, to do everything they do as they move through the world. This gives them the ability to reach people directly, which is a real problem. So uh, I don't believe we can allow a little bit of it. I believe it to be cancerous. You can't have a little bit of cancer. You either have cancer or you don't. Uh, and so we all need to be talking about the rollout of the CBDC and why it's so vitally important to understand this in, in, China's, in, in the context of China's grand strategy. So what could be implemented to stop that? I think uh, uh, legislators uh, and or the Fed should simply outlaw uh, the ownership of the Chinese central bank digital currency in America and Europe and the UK for that matter, those same that legislative bodies need to get together and do that, or it's going to be too late. And so you mentioned brave new world, but what would the global world look like if China succeeds? Today, China's currency settles uh, about 1.8% of all global cross-border transactions. And that number is even misleading because when you peel back the layers of that onion, you see that about 95% of that 1.8% is settling in Hong Kong, i.e. China trading with itself. Um, so for all intents and purposes, no one around the world accepts today the Chinese RMB as legal tender for anything, right? They use dollars all over the world, dollars, euros, yen, and pounds, but really just dollars, um, to settle all of their purchases of energy, all their purchases of food and basic materials, and that's how they operate their economy. So when we talk about this quantum leap if their rollout of the CBDC is, is successful and they get everyone that, that engages in trade with China to settle in their, in their CBDC and everyone that invests in China to settle in their CBDC, I believe their, their, their ownership of the global currency settlement world could go from zero to as high as 15%, basically in an overnight move. Now, that doesn't mean that the hegemonic position of the US dollar uh, has changed and China's got it. That just means we go from mid 80s, uh, maybe down to 70. We still, the US dollar will still reign supreme. But if China has the ability to operate outside the US dollar system, they still have a closed capital account. They're still a totalitarian government committing crimes against humanity. And now their military, they'll be able to, they would be able to move and be even more belligerent than they are today, uh, militaristically and economically because they have an alternative system to work on. So I think that is really important to understand for everyone. And so what are some things, say, average Americans could do to try and help? I mean, we should stop buying Chinese stuff. We should boycott Chinese goods. We should boycott the Olympics in Beijing. You know, we don't, I feel like Beijing 22, 2022 is similar to Berlin in 1936. It's insane. That we would that we would go there. I know we're talking about a diplomatic boycott, but we should move the games. And having our athletes show up there is just an embarrassment to the world. There are plenty of things we can do as individuals in America to lessen our dependency uh, or our our business with China. 
We don't. We can get cheap T-shirts and cheap electronics somewhere else. We can. Southeast Asia is a big place. Um, Mexico is a great place. South America is a great place. We can. Maybe it costs a little bit more to have a T-shirt or some cheap electronics, but who cares? So what? We're dealing with the world's largest geo uh, economic aggressor that we've ever seen. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And joining us now, John. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you back on the show. And thank you for having me again. I really appreciate it. And so recently, there was the summit between President Biden and Xi Jinping, and some reports are saying there were no real breakthroughs afterwards. But what's your take on the whole situation? The reason why no progress has been made is because Taiwan is the main talking point, and essentially, China and, and the U.S. are speaking two very different languages, politically anyway. And uh, I think that's why no progress was really met. And I think it was all for show, all for show, you know. Um, I don't think there was any real significance to it. China has to, has to look like that it's coming to the table. You know, we saw that at uh, the Glasgow, at the recent climate summit, the CCP didn't even come to the table. It, 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 uh, uh, Xi didn't even come to, to Beijing, but, uh, it, you know, he sent a, sent a strongly worded statement, if you will, you know, about uh, committing, committing to a, a climate goal. And it's, I think it's a little bit similar with the meeting with Biden. China needs to look like that it's playing ball. Biden needs to look, uh, how should I say, he has to look somewhat competent, especially after falling asleep in Glasgow. He had to redeem himself. So um, this is what I mean by it's all for show. I, I, I think Joe Biden knows and the Biden administration knows, especially when it comes to Taiwan, that you can meet for three hours, 33 hours, 33 days, 33 weeks. It doesn't really matter because China is obsessed with 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 uh, the reunification uh, issue. And uh, it's it's not going to budge. And this is why I think it's for sure. Xi knew coming in where, where he stood. Biden knew and knows where Xi stands. But they have to meet because they're two superpowers and and... I suppose it's it's like a geopolitical game of chess. You know, they need to sit down and figure each other out. And so you mentioned Taiwan, and right after this meeting, Beijing sent fighter jets into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. And some have been saying that the next war that breaks out won't just be about how much firepower a country has, but also through soft powers. So what's your take on that? I, I think it's possible that we could have both type of wars. I think it's unlikely uh, that the U.S. and China will will uh, come into direct conflict, and by that I mean gunfire. It's not, of course it's not impossible. Of course it's not impossible. But uh, cyber cyber war is it's already playing out in China. There is a it's like a, a cyber the equivalent of the Olympics for for cyber geeks essentially. So they, they, they gather. And uh, the goal of the whole weekend affair is essentially to try and break into US tech. So uh, the winners of, of the most recent uh, competition in Chengdu managed to crack into iPhone 13 Pro in less than 15 seconds. Um, at the event as well, uh, they the, the competitors tried to breach uh, the security of um, Apple software, Google, Microsoft. Um, so what does this tell you? And why is this so significant? So in the US, you have Google and Microsoft are, and Google is much more, as we all know, it's much more than just a search engine. You have Google partnering with hospitals in the US and, and uh, they're, they're using, uh, say, data from patients and storing it on the cloud. So you have more and more U.S. hospitals that are outsourcing their data to Google and, and Microsoft, as I said. What happens when these get hacked and the hacking comes from China and you have all this stolen data, you have patients' records, you have very, very intimate data there stored. So th this is what I mean is 
this is a much more direct threat, I believe, to the US than traditional warfare. And it's far more difficult to detect um, because it's essentially invisible to a large degree, if that makes sense. And so what would be some ways of, say, stemming or defending against these paramilitary threats? A lot of it boils down to education. We need, or the U.S. needs to be more specific, uh, smarter minds. Now, this brings me back to China again, and uh, it's uh, creating actually a, a sort of cybersecurity college, like a super college in Wuhan, as we speak, uh, has plans of training and certifying and graduating up to 70,000 cybersecurity experts each year. Now, in China, the, the major, uh, uh, the most popular majors are like civil engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, computer science, technology, so forth, AI. In the US, the the most popular majors are journalism, communication, social sciences, visual and performance art, uh, performance arts. This is not to, this, my background is psychology, social sciences, soft, soft science, if you will. We need more hard science majors and we need, we need more STEM graduates and the US is not producing enough. Uh, China is producing far more STEM graduates and who controls the STEM graduates really controls the future, in my opinion. And the U.S. is just not producing enough STEM graduates. And if you're not producing enough gra uh, graduates in the appropriate fields, you're relying on uh, foreign talent to come in. Now, that's that. I'm not against. I'm not against foreign talent. I'm Irish, so you know. Uh, but it's very dangerous. When you're relying on uh, when you're relying on talent from other countries and you're not producing it yourself, it's very difficult to compete to compete with uh, an aggressive an aggressive power like the CCP. So why is there such a big difference between what Americans and Chinese are choosing to study? I wrote an article about this for the New York Post, and uh, the the answer is it's it's. It would be funny if it wasn't so tragic, but a lot of students just say that STEM STEM subjects are too difficult. They're just too difficult. And that, that's what, I, actually, there's been surveys done and papers published. And uh, students who opt to go down different avenues often say that, ah, if, maths, if math wasn't so difficult, then I might pursue it. Uh, engineering, if it wasn't so difficult, I might pursue it. So what it needs is more uh, physicists and engineers and uh, that's you know it's, it's difficult it's difficult to get a PhD in physics I can only imagine get a PhD in, in uh, say quantum computing AI uh, I, also these are very new fields so there's a there's a little bit of the fear of the unknown there um, you know, the average person doesn't know what quantum computing really is. We hear about AI, but again, if you ask most people to talk about AI, they don't really know what it is. So perhaps perhaps there's a failure there in, in middle schools and high schools to actually educate students on, on um, what exactly these fields require. So going forward, how do you see things playing out? All is not lost. I, I must state this, uh, all is not lost. And I, I've i read numerous articles about, you know, it's essentially give up now, wave the white flag, China owns the future. Not at all. Absolutely not. You know, they have demographic issues there. Uh, they, uh, you know, uh, the, the population is, is aging rapidly. Um, and this the CCP still relies on economic espionage. The ball is still in in the United States. It's still on the United States side of the court. But I do feel that the U.S. is 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 losing is is losing its power, um, and 
I suppose China China won't stop until it it becomes the it becomes the, the the preeminent force in 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 technology. So that's there's there's a quantum computing, there's AI, there's biotechnology. These these three areas, China is putting a lot of a lot of focus in becoming into becoming the the primary force in, in these three areas. Now, for them to uh, to actually realize this goal, of course, they're going to focus on educating and and graduating these these majors. But there's also going to be a, a a huge focus on stealing more valuable data from the US. Um, and a good start would be banning the likes of TikTok, WeChat, these apps that are clearly used for espionage. Um, that, that would be a helpful that would be a helpful start. And the second part then would be addressing the education education issue. One good point is New York has a new mayor. Uh, Eric Adams will assume office very soon. And he, he said he will reverse the the idea to erase the gifted gifted students program. He's actually going to reverse that. That's a welcome start. Uh, you know, New York is the, the cultural capital of the US. So it sends a message, I think. Um, but uh, Hopefully, more more people with the mindset of Eric Adams come along, and this could be the saving grace for the U.S. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much, Tiffany. All the best. And for those just tuning in, that was today's special episode with Kyle Bass, founder and principal of Heyman Capital Management, and John McGlynn, journalist and researcher. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.